excellent model systems for understanding how both natural and sexual selection uh, mediate diversification. And I think the visual system in particular is a really interesting system to study from this perspective. In particular, um, the opsin genes that initiate the first step in visual photo transduction. So you can imagine, for example, if you have a particular cichlid and it's living at the top of the water column of a lake, and it has a very broad spectral environment, and it has a rhodopsin in this case, pigment that absorbs at a characteristic wavelength of light, 500 nanometers. A closely related cichlid that's living at the bottom of the lake is encountering a markedly different spectral environment. So as you can see with depth, this wavelength narrows into the blue end of the spectrum. And we might expect to see changes in the oxygen gene that mediate a shift in this pigment to the blue end of the spectrum, which would then better match the spectral environment that this fish is inhabiting. So there's been a lot of work characterizing these sorts of processes in African cichlids. I'm interested in neotropical cichlid diversity. And while these cichlids aren't as diverse as their African relatives, they do still have a considerable amount of species richness. And I've just outlined here the three major clades of cichlids. And you can see that there's still a great deal of trophic, morphological, and there's also a great deal of life history diversity in this group as well. And in contrast to the African radiations, which took place primarily in lake environments, the neotropical radiation was un under underwent primarily in riverine environments in South and Central America. So what we end up with is this very nice continental macroevolutionary experiment uh, that we can also look at from a molecular perspective as well. What do we know about neotropical cichlid ops and evolution? The answer is not a whole lot, um, but there's been some work from one of my labs, the Chang lab, and also Helen Broad's lab at UT, that showed that they have a reduced set of ops and genes relative to the African cichlids. We also found that African and neotropical cichlid rhodopsin showed divergent selection, not when you look at the different African neotropical clades, but rather this divergent selection in rhodopsin was mediated by differences in lake and riverine environments. And this was followed up really nicely by a study last year in MBE from Axel Meyer's group, which contributed uh, some lake cichlid, neotropical lake cichlid rhodopsin sequences as well. So I was interested in the neotropical cichlids on their own, independent of African cichlids. I wanted to broadly sequence the rhodopsin gene across the neotropical cichlid tree. And I was interested in whether the molecular evolution of rhodopsin could be influenced by different evolutionary histories or perhaps different habitats. So what we did is we did a cross-species exon capture experiment of rhodopsin across neotropical cichlids. So we designed probes from Tilapia RH1, which is an African riverine cichlid. And at this point, we weren't necessarily sure that we would be able to recover full length sequences that would be appropriate for molecular evolutionary analyses, if they would be accurate sequences. Uh, but if this did work, we would achieve broad capture across our group of interest. And this capture would be independent of tissue type or developmental stage. Fortunately for me, it did work out. And we successfully captured full length rhodopsin across the neotropical cichlid tree. And I have 105 species in total, and we have representatives from every major clade of neotropical cichlids. We have representatives from Central America and other specialists, for example, these predatory pike cichlids. So how can we test for selection with this data? Uh, when you have interspecific molecular data like what I have, we use this parameter omega, or dn over ds, which is the ratio of non-synonymous or amino acid modifying substitutions over synonymous or silent mutations. So when this parameter is less than one, uh, this is referred to as negative or purifying selection. When it exceeds one, we have an overabundance of non-synonymous mutations, and this is referred to as positive selection. In most cases, we would expect that protein coding genes would have an omega of less than one because you wouldn't necessarily want a protein with an excess of amino acid altering mutations. However, in some cases, we see positive selection 
and certain genes, for example, ecologically relevant genes, sensory genes, etc. So we can ask then, does the model incorporating positive selection fit our data better than one that doesn't? And what I see when I look across the entire neotropical cichlid rhodopsin tree is that in fact we do have positive selection in a subset of sites. And you can see here, this is the spectrum of codons across the protein, and this is our omega value uh, on the y-axis here. And when we look at non-visual control genes that I also analyzed from the same exon capture experiment, we don't see mm -hmm. such a pattern. So usually these analyses of positive selection uh, focus on these random sites panel models that just look at whether or not you see pervasive positive selection across your gene of interest. But in large macroevolutionary data sets like the one that I have, we can also ask uh, more complicated questions. And we can use models called clade models that can test other hypotheses about molecular divergence. And these models ask whether or not there's a class of sites that have a divergent omega parameter. So what we can do is we can say, well, maybe I expect to see divergent selection in this foreground clade that I've highlighted here. And we can compare this against a model that doesn't allow for divergence and see which is the better fit. We can do this for a variety of different partitions. We can also do multiple partitions if we're interested. And our partitions don't necessarily have to be uh, localized to only one clade. They can be divided up as well. What I was also interested in is more ecologically motivated questions as well. So in this particular clade, Carolini, we see that some of these members actually manage to invade and diversify within Central America as well, to a pretty impressive extent, considering the fact that this is a much res more restricted geographic area relative to South America. We also know that the photic environment that these cichlids were encountering during their diversification in Central America was much different from their South American counterparts. So in South America, we primarily have turbid, red shifted environments. In Central America, these cichlids were encountering primarily clear environments. So I wondered how this might have affected divergence of the Rhodopsin gene. We can then compare the fit of our different models that we've selected and go through them and compare. And what we arrive at is the Central American partition being the superior fit. However, I haven't told the whole story because in fact it's more complicated there are some South American members embedded within the Central American clade. And in fact, these cichlids were able to reinvade South America, and that's where they are right now. When we incorporate that into our model, we actually find the superior fit. When we look at this data more closely, what we see is accelerated Rodolphin divergence during the invasion of Central America. So, the South American cichlids are still undergoing positive selection to a certain extent, uh, which you can see here. But Central America is almost triple in terms of the level of positive selection. And actually, these rates are comparable to those found in rapidly radiating <coughs> African lake cichlid lineages. When we compare these against our non visual control genes, we don't see this pattern. When we look more closely at the different sites under positive selection between South and Central America, we do see that there are certain sites that are under selection in both. However, I have pinpointed some sites that are not overlapping between the two different groups. When we look at these more closely uh, on the crystal structure, we can see that some of them cluster together, uh, a number are near the chromophore, which actually activates the and when we look at these in more detail from the literature, we see that site 83 uh, is actually a spectral tuning mutation in African cichlids, and it also affects the kinetics of dim light sensitivity. And this is under positive selection in our Central American data set. And actually, my lab mate Sarah will be following up on some really interesting studies of site 83 in the next talk. 166 and 169 mediate spectral differences in rhodopsin between benthic and littoral African cichlid morphs. And a South American site under selection is known to shift spectral sensitivity as well. So this acceleration in 
rates of molecular evolution in Bergonson, is it consistent with what we know about neotropical cichlids, evolutionary biology? And I would argue yes. So we know from the literature that there's a high incidence of trophic polymorphism and neotropic plasticity in this group. There's also certain lineages that have sexual dimorphism, which is in contrast to the rest of the South American cichlids, which show very low instances of sexual dimorphism. We also see um, in work from one of my supervisors' labs, Fernando Lopez Fernandez, that there are increased rates of lineage diversification and functional morphospace diversity in Central America. And this has been hypothesized to be due to this release of constraints that they encountered when they entered Central America. They weren't encountering other set competing South American fish lineages and were free to diversify into a more broad range of lesions. We also see this when we look at morphological evolutionary rates, and this is some preliminary work from Hernan's lab, where we see in South America, early on in their radiation, there's this sharp increase in the rate of morphological evolution, and then a decrease. In Central America, when we look at when they invaded, we see a sharp increase again in their rates of morphological evolution. So, to wrap things up, I think there are a couple of conclusions that we can draw from this. First, that this cross-species axon, axon capture experiment was successfully used for a large-scale comparative study of an ecologically relevant set of three genes. Neotropical cyclic adoption shows evidence for accelerated evolutionary rates upon invasion of Central America. And there are different sites under positive selection between Central and South America that may mediate adaptation to different photic environments. Thank you very much for your attention. I just want to call your attention to a couple more talks from both my labs. If you're interested in the visual system or if you're interested in cichlids, uh, definitely check them out. Thank you. We have time for questions.